All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's a wonderful morning, isn't it? Here on campus, summer morning, nothing better. I'm glad you're all here. And I hope uh, each family got a handout. Did you all get a handout? If you didn't, ask one of the peer advisors for a handout. And we also have some more here. If you didn't get it, you can always get it after my talk. Um, I'd like to welcome you all who are here in this room. I'd also like to welcome our online viewers today. We are using this session today to uh, film my talk so that those who were not able to join us this morning have a chance to also listen to the talk. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the CLA Dean's Office. If you're not planning to study in the College of Liberal Arts, you're in the wrong session here. And again, you can ask one of the peer advisors to uh, guide you to the correct session. Uh, here's your first quiz. Students, who am I? Yeah, the guy on, on the bottom, right? My name is Achim Kopp. I am uh, one of two associate deans in the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, I am actually, by trade, a professor of Latin. That's what I do. But I also have some administrative duties. I have a colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Denny. You can see his picture here. He's a mathematician. Uh, he is also an associate dean. Uh, I deal more with uh, student matters, so if you students, new students, have any issues, you probably will come to me. Uh, Dr. Danny Dean deals more with faculty matters. And our boss is Dr. Anita Gustafson. Uh, she's a historian, and I can tell you, all of us in the dean's office, uh, Occasionally, well, uh, and actually regularly, in my case and in Dr. Denny's case, we teach classes. Uh, and so we are not, it is not that we only are administrators. Now, we could not do our job without some help. And I want to introduce to you our uh, administrative assistant. Uh, on the top, you see Mrs. Pam Benedict. At the second picture, actually, I have to confess this is a little dated as of this week. Uh, Penny Hartley has moved into another department, and we have a new colleague, Yanni Higdon, uh, who is our new uh, second administrative assistant. And I really encourage you, especially the students among you, to stop by our offices sometime and get to know us and also get to know our uh, administrative assistants. Here is where you find us. We're right next door to this building in the administration building. Uh, it is a, a very interesting building. You should really take the time and go in there. It is worth a, a stop. All right, here's what I'd like to do today. Uh, we have about an hour and some minutes, and uh, here's the program that I put together for you. First, since you all, uh, having, you all have decided to study in the College of Liberal Arts, I thought it would be worth our time to talk a little bit about the liberal arts what you can expect to get out of that sort of uh, study that you're undertaking. Second, I have to explain the curriculum to you so that you're all informed about our offerings and how it works. And that leads us to uh, point three here. We'll have to talk about the fine print, some of the, some of the rules and regulations that we have in the college. Uh, I can at least mention these things to you today and then you can, in the future, uh, get more details on each of these issues. Uh, and finally, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, we'll, make, we'll try to make that happen. Here's what I cannot do today. I know that a lot of you are pre-professional in some way. Some of you are pre-med, some of you maybe pre-dentistry or pre-law. Those programs are fairly complex and they're all different. And so I, have, I do not have the time today to talk to you about those. If you're interested in any of these pre-professional programs, there is, uh, we are offering sessions today uh, at one o'clock from one to 1.30 and from 1.45 to 2.15.
Dr. Carol Bocross is going to offer uh, um, sessions, especially about on these pre-science programs, so pre-med and, and related programs. They take place in the UC at the Farmers Market. I'm sure you'll be able to find that. So at one o'clock and one forty-five. All right. So why have you all chosen to study the liberal arts? Maybe our first question should be, what are the liberal arts? Have you ever asked yourselves that question? Well, I'm a Latinist, <laughs> so I usually look at the origin of words, especially if they come from Latin, and this one does. Liberal, the word liberal, comes from the Latin word liber, and liber means what? Free, yes, that's where our word liberty comes from. Right? Uh, it does not uh, have anything to do with the word liba, by the way. There's a difference in Latin between liba and liba. They're spelled the same, but they're pronounced differently. Liba means book, and that has nothing to do with liberal. Right? That's where library comes from, from liba. Uh, anyway, uh, the liberal arts in antiquity, when they first came out, were those pursuits that were undertaken by free people. Okay. So people who were not working with their hands, like a slave. They were free in pursuing certain intellectual studies. And uh, then this whole concept went through the Middle Ages. Uh, there was a division made, quite interestingly, in the Middle Ages between the trivium and the quatrivium. Again, there's some Latin here, right? Trivium means literally the three-way. Quatrivium means the four-way. So there is a there are groups of three and four subjects, you could say, or fields of study. The trivium included grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And the quatrivium was, was more mathematically oriented. Uh, arith arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and also mathematically oriented music, actually, quite interestingly. So that's sort of the, the history of the term. As what does it mean today? Well, today, you can take our College of Liberal Arts as a, as a guideline. In our college, we, pers we look, we have, we have included fields like the arts, the humanities, natural sciences, social sciences. So we have a whole array of different fields of study. But we also lately have put a lot of emphasis on service. So I think in a, in, in a modern liberal arts college, that's what you have to expect. You will actually be expected to contribute to some, some way of serving the community. Um, we pride ourselves in actively engaging our students. And I will show you that later. Our classes are fairly small. We do not lecture that much in the College of Liberal Arts. We, we talk more to each other. Uh, and of course, we try to provide our students with the freedom to explore. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment in some more detail. Uh, in a way, this is a, a first step to lifelong learning. That's what we want you to come out of. You are able to pursue all sorts of interesting fields and intellectual pursuits on your own daily. So, our world is changing. I'm going to show you a few items that maybe your parents will, um, will uh, remember, like this. <laughs> Students may not ever have used one of these. Or you know what this is? Slide rule. Yeah, when I went to school in Germany, grade school, this is what we used. We didn't have calculators. We used slide rule. Look at this. You all have a wristwatch? I'm still old fashioned, but some of you may not have one. Huh? I hope you read books. I don't know if you, well, you, you use pens, but I don't know if you ever use maps. What do you do instead? All these things today are in this. Right? And 
you all have it in your pocket. And our world has changed. And this change has happened, I would say, in the last 15 years. Right? 15 years, I didn't have a cell phone. Say 15 years ago, I didn't have a cell phone. And you probably didn't either. And this shows how rapidly things are changing. And we have to be ready for that sort of change. And that's what we're trying to do here in the college. We're trying to get you ready for this. Here are a few facts that I, that I drew from some uh, uh, sources. Every year, more than 30% of, uh, of the entire US labor force changes jobs. That's the word change again. 50% of workers have been with their company less than five years. Today, students will have 10 to 14 jobs by the time they're 38. Imagine that. 10 to 14 times to change. And the jobs and careers of tomorrow have not been created yet. You need to be ready for that. And the way to get you ready for that is by showing you uh, ways to do that in the college. Now, in return, this is what you have to do. <laughs> and I'm with you, parents. I have uh, two kids in college myself, and believe me, I've carried that box. <laughs> Here is what we don't think will happen. Hopefully not. We want you to come out of this with more than just a hat. And see, so, here are a couple of uh, skills that employers are looking at um, and want to have in their employees. They want to have them to be able to work in team structure, so teamwork is important. They want to, uh, them to be able to make decisions and solve problems, to communicate, and I think that includes both writing and uh, speaking to plan and organize well, prioritize, and to obtain and process information. And those are exactly the kinds of things we will teach you. And it will not matter what major you have, okay? Uh, you will come out with the same outcome, uh, and you will be able to uh, do those things that your employers are, are expecting. Okay, so we've talked about all the theoretical framework, how things are changing, what, and what people are expecting of you. Now I want to show you how it's going to work. I think uh, when you come in August and uh, are going to be with us for a couple of months, you're going to go, you're going to go through three stages. And these three stages are adaptation, exploration and transformation. Let me ask the students amongst you. Who of you has your own bedroom in your house? All right. Almost all the students have their hands up. Right. Well, say goodbye to that. <laughs> when you come to Mercer in August, you will be assigned a roommate. And you will have to adapt to the lifestyle of that roommate in some way, right? That roommate may be a, someone who goes to bed late or someone who rises early, and you'll have to deal with that in some way. And this is only one aspect of the things that you'll have to adapt to. There are many, many others. Uh, the food in the cafeteria, your professors, your friends, the circle of uh, call, you know, fellow students that you're dealing with. All those people will be different and will be strange and you'll have to adapt to them. You will go from a fairly highly structured environment that you have encountered in high school, you know, with all the classes very clearly set for you, the guidance counselor who meets with you regularly, tells you exactly what to do. From that highly structured environment, you will go to a less, much less structured environment. Much more of the responsibility will be on you. 
that means that you will have to prioritize. Right? You will have to find the right balance between class activities, classes that you take, and extracurricular activities. You will have to, to manage your time. And of course, that is a skill that you will have to have later in life as well. We want you to explore. We want you to take your time here and find out what really interests you. Uh, in a way, we force you to do that by asking you to go through a series of courses uh, that we call the foundational studies. And I will later explain to you the two tracks that we offer you and that you can choose from. We will offer you courses that force you to engage different opinions. I'm thinking of our INT classes in particular, the integrative classes that you will uh, take, or maybe the great books courses that would be an alternative to that. And I will tell you about those also. We will also force you to engage certain fields of study in more detail. We will ask you to, to choose a major at some point, uh, and a minor, and maybe a second major. So it's not just the, the broad education that you get, but we're also going to go into depth in certain fields. And, you know, I am the, the dean who deals with uh, major declaration forms and so on, and sometimes students come to me and they tell me, oh, I, have, I have considered to change majors and they're very timid about it. And I actually tell them, that's great. We want you to change majors because we, we are glad if you, uh, during the course of your studies, have discovered new things. Okay, so it is nothing bad to actually go through Mercer and maybe change your major once or twice. Um, we want you to engage other opinions. And that's why we offer you small classes and lots of discussion groups and seminar style of classes. And one way of doing that, engaging otherness uh, in particular, is going abroad. Okay, so I really hope that a large majority of you, you students in this room, will at some point during your studies at Mercer go abroad. I am a product of going abroad, okay? I grew up in Germany. Uh, all my schooling was done there, all my you know, high school, university, everything. I wanted to be an English teacher and a Latin teacher in a German high school. That was my plan. Until I went abroad. Okay, because they sent me, my, one of my subjects was English, so they sent me to Britain to learn English. And I talked with this very distinct British accent for a while. And then I went to America for another study abroad year. And I changed my accent. And I also got stuck. Okay, ever since then, well, I went home for a little while, but I came back to this country because I was fascinated by it, because it opened new horizons for me, and I finally ended up here. My work is now here. My life has changed by going abroad. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to scare you parents, uh, but it's not the case that all your kids, whenever they go abroad, they will stay there. <laughs> I did. But um, it will certainly offer them new horizons and new insights. So I, I encourage you to take advantage of some of these really exciting programs that we have. You can choose from a short-term spring break program. I just led one uh, six or eight weeks ago uh, to Italy. Right? I had a couple of students in class six. We went to the Naples area in Italy went to Pompeii, climbed Mount Vesuvius, and all those things. That was an introduction to those students. First time for many of them to go to a foreign country. And it was just a couple of days. You can also take a faculty-led program in the summer. Uh, we have right now, I know one in Spain, for example. We have many others. We have Mercer on Mission. If you haven't heard about Mercer on Mission, you need to ask someone about it because it's an exciting program that com combines service learning with studying abroad. And then, of course, we have more extensive study abroad stays for a whole semester, um, which I think, for many of you,
should also be here. So um, you see, I'm a big fan of studying abroad, so I, I want to encourage you all to do that as well. All right, I've talked about adaptation and exploration. The last thing that's going to happen to you in your first couple of months will be transformation. Uh, you will not be able to help yourselves but broadening your horizons. You will hopefully be able to express your own beliefs and perceptions in a, in a clearer and more sophisticated way than you were able to do when you came to us. And you will emerge after four years for sure as a much more, more mature and sophisticated person. So, that was the first third of my talk, and you're still alive, right? <laughs> All right. So now, I've talked about the theory. Now, let's talk about the practice. Here is the curriculum of the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, in order to go through that, I think we need to talk about a couple of terms. Some of you probably are familiar with these terms, but I, I think not everybody especially if you are a first generation student, you may not have uh, grown up with these kinds of uh, terms. So I want to go over these quickly. Um, credit hours, you all will hear that term a lot. Uh, credit hours are the hours in a way that you sit in a classroom, okay? Typically our courses are three hour courses. We have a couple of four and five hour courses as well one hour courses, but most the standard uh, course is a three hour course. Uh, that means that uh, you meet, uh, the course meets three times a week for 50 minutes. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We also have a Tuesday, Thursday pattern where the time length is longer. It's actually 75 minutes, but it's only two meetings per week. We have a semester system at Mercer. Um, parents among you may be familiar with the quarter system. Uh, when I came to Mercer about 23 years ago, we were changing it. We just changed over from the quarter system to a semester system. And I think most schools today have a semester system. There's also a summer term, which is actually going on right now, with uh, two sessions, summer session one and summer session two. Um, an academic checklist. Oh, I didn't say that. You all have your handouts, right? So on the handouts, you want to take a look at that. The first three pages are slides from my presentation. I just picked a couple of slides that I thought were particularly important. Now don't worry. The other slides that I'm showing you, we're going to put online. So if you want to look back at these slides, you can easily do that online. But look at the very last page of your handout. On the reverse, you have an academic checklist. This is the academic checklist for the foundational studies. This is what I'm talking about here. This is going to be very important for you because you need to, be, to keep track of the courses that you're taking and make sure you are fulfilling all the requirements. So this checklist uh, will help you with that. And we're going over that in a moment. If you want more information, you need this. The university catalog. We're right now in the process of making the new one. The one you will be getting in, in August is pretty much ready for the printer. And they will, I think, give you a physical copy like this, but it's also online. So parents, if you don't have that copy, you can always look it up online. In a way, the university catalog is like the Bible for your program because all the rules and regulations for a certain major, for foundational studies, it's all in here. And if you have any questions about it, come see me, guess what I'll do? I will look, up, I will look it up in the catalog, and I'll go by the language of that catalog. So this is very important, a uh, very important instrument for you. Another term is full-time student versus part-time student. At Mercer, you're a full-time student if you take 12 hours. This can be very important for financial aid. Um, and being a student at Mercer is a full-time job. A 
Okay? Let's just look at uh, an example. Exa uh, our standard teaching load, class load, is 15 hours. Okay? So for 15 hours a week, we sit in class. Now, our professors are demanding uh, in many ways, and they need you to use some time on preparation and maybe reading and working after you have taken your notes and so on. So you have to figure about two hours per hour in the classroom in addition. So now you have 15 hours and 30 hours. That's 45 hours just for classroom, for, for, for academic work. Okay? And this is not all that makes you a student. You will have extracurricular activities as well. So being a student at Mercer is a full-time job. And I think this is how you have to approach this. There is no way of being uh, successful without really applying yourself. Okay? Uh, I'll tell you that right away. It's very important to, um, to be open to that concept that we will be demanding your work and your attention. Okay, another important uh, term is quality points. Um, quality points is the number of credit hours multiplied by the grade that you get in the course. Okay? Mercer has a very strange grading system. I was surprised when I first came from my first uh, institution to Mercer. Mercer has no minus grades. Okay? We have no A minus or B minus. We have A and then B plus, B, C plus, C, all the way up to F. These grades all carry a numerical value. So an A is, carries four, a B carries three, a B plus carries 3.5. So if you sit in a class that has three credit hours, let's say like in this religion 130 here that's listed, and you earn a C plus, then you would multiply the three credit hours by the value for C plus, which is 2.5, and you come out at 7.5 quality points. Okay? If you add up all the quality points for a given semester, in this case here, we would come out at 35.5. You notice the student took UNB 101, and the grade is S. Do you all know what that is? Satisfactory. So this, this course is different. You don't get a grade per se. You get either an S or a U, satisfactory or unsatisfactory. SU grading does not carry any value uh, in terms of mathematical value. So that's why that course doesn't give you any quality points. If the student care, uh, adds up all the quality points, he or she can then divide that by the credit hours, the number of credit hours. And if you do that, you get your GPA. Okay? So your GPA is um, quality points divided by credit hours. Everybody understand that? And we will, of course, keep a running uh, log of your GPA. You can always look that up on, in your records. You will not be alone. Okay? Um, there will be advisors all the way through, starting today actually. When you uh, have your session today, you will meet your orientation advisor. And that person will help you go over your schedule and make sure you really get the courses that you want in your first semester. Uh, once you come to campus, you will all, every student in this room will take a UMB 101 class. And the instructor of your UMB 101 class will be your, um, your first year advisor. Okay? And uh, that person will stay with you until you choose a major. Once you choose a major, he will assign you a, a new advisor from the area of your major. And that will probably be the most important advisor for you because that person stays with you through graduation. There will be some others that can help you, like if you do undergraduate research, for example, uh, the, that professor will be really important for you. And also, if you are pre-professional, the pre-professional advisors will also have a, a big uh, 
theory. So please make use of those advisors. Um, you're not alone. Let's talk about the structure of our curriculum. I would say there are four parts to our curriculum. There's the foundational studies. Then we will, we will have to choose an academic major. We want you to have additional depth. And we want you to have electives. Okay. Altogether, you will have to have 120 hours. And if you do not have 120 hours, you cannot graduate. Okay. Now look, the foundational studies already give you something, some, somewhere between 32 and 41 hours. So why is there a, a gap? Well, it's because some students come in, for example, with foreign language and they don't have to do this. That's why it's not um, uh, totally unified. Academic majors also vary in their size. Here is a secret. The Latin major, the one I uh, direct, is the smallest major on campus. It has 27 hours. But you can have majors that go up all the way to, I think, 73 hours. Can you guess what that might be? Biggest major is neuroscience, 73 hours. So there is a big um, difference in size. And that's why, in additional depth, if you have just a regular major, we want you to do additional depth. So you will either major in a second field or minor in another field. Uh, if you have one of those really large majors, if you're a neuroscience major, for example, you don't need to take additional depth already included in that large major. The rest of your uh, hours you fill up with electives up to the 120. Another requirement that you have to graduate is that altogether you have to have a 2.0 GPA. Okay, so remember how we tried to figure out how you, how you uh, calculate this GPA? You have to have a 2.0 in everything overall. All right, let's talk about the two tracks in the foundational studies. Here they are. The first one is what we call the interpretive track. Our students call it INT. And the other one is the great books track. You probably have already been asked which one you want to be in, and you've probably already made a choice. Now, you can always change. It is not written in stone yet. If you want, if you are, you know, if you are inclined to change that, talk with your uh, orientation advisor. Look at how there are black and orange uh, sections on, on both, in both tracks. The orange ones are the ones that are common to both. So no student can, can do a, a course of studies here without doing those orange things. Now in the two tracks, however, differ in the black parts. Uh, everybody has to take UMB 101, everybody has to take something in the natural world, mathematical reasoning and foreign language, and also experiential learning. I'll explain to you in a moment what this exactly is. If you do the INT, you are going to go through three INT courses. They're actually very interesting. The first course is called Understanding Self and Others. So the INT 101 starts, up, starts out with yourself in relation to others. The second INT course is about local communities. So you're probably going to engage certain communities on campus or maybe in Macon. And the third course, INT 301, is about global communities. So you see how the courses go from very much centered on your own and your relation to others, all the way into the global sphere. If you choose that track, you also have to go and take a couple of courses from what we call blocks. The blocks are religious heritage, Western heritage, creative expression, and human behavior and society. In a moment, I show you what kind of courses these are. With this sort of cafeteria style of 
getting courses does not appeal to you, you can go to the Great Books track. In Great Books, you go through a series of seven Great Books courses. And uh, I will also later show you how they are structured. So for you at the moment, the decision is Great Books 101 or IMT 101. If you want Great Books, you have to start this fall. Okay, do not wait. If, if you want great books and great books 101 is not on your schedule, you have a problem. And you have to tell your advisor to change that. If you are in IMT, you can actually wait till spring to take IMT 101. Little secret, if you are in great books 101, that great books 101 also satisfies IMT 101. That means you could easily change over. Great Books 101 would count as your IMT 101 and you could then just go on the IMT track if you didn't like Great Books 101. It does not work the same the other way. If you start out with IMT 101 and then at a certain point your roommate was in Great Books, you really are envious of him or her and such great things they do in Great Books and you want to change, well, you can change but you will have to wait till the fall and start over in Great Books 101. Okay, so this is, in a way, a very important decision that you're making. All right, let me talk about the orange stuff. I think it was meaning the ones that are common. So the first thing everybody has to take is UNB 101. This is a, an introduction to college life. Uh, so in other words, you will talk about study skills, cultural diversity, critical thinking, ethics, personal relationships, health and safety and careers. Um, every college has a course like that. Ours is a one credit hour course uh, with SU grading. So it will not affect your GPA. In these courses, we have peer advisors which will, who will help you also in addition to the instructor uh, engaging these subjects. Another course that everybody has to take is in the natural world category. Uh, you could also say science. Right? So we want you to take some introductory science course. Now it has to be one of the ones that are listed here. You can't just choose any course in biology or in chemistry. It has to be one of those that are listed. Similarly, you have to take a course in mathematical reasoning. Notice I'm not saying mathematics, because the courses that, you, that are uh, available are not necessarily math courses. There are a couple, as you can see, 104, 141, and 191, all would count. But you can also take a computer science course, or you can even take a philosophy 180, which is called logic and language. And we think that it has enough about mathematical concepts in it that we can count it as your mathematical reasoning course. Or you can take STA. Any guesses what that might be? Statistics. Very good. Okay. Let's talk about math placement. Um, I think you all should, by now, students, should all have a math index. Okay? We, we calculate uh, your math index in order to place you in the right math course. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, to me this is all magic, but somehow they use your, your SAT score and they use your GPA in high school to come up with a math index. If you're satisfied with your math index and you think it places you in the correct math course, do nothing. Just accept the course that has been chosen for you. If you're not satisfied, you can take the math placement test today, actually. Uh, and you can then check whether you may place into a different kind of math course. The math placement test is offered today, right after this session, from 10.30 to 11.30 in Stetson Hall. And if you have an, a, a, a advising appointment during that time, you can also take it from 1 to 2.30. Again, in Stetson Hall. You can't miss it. There are big signs there for the math placement test. So I encourage you, if you have any doubts about your math index and your placement, please take the placement test. 
foreign language. Every student in the CLA has to take one year of foreign languages. Unless you can show us that you've already done it in school or otherwise. Okay? So if you take it here, we can offer you Chinese, French, German, Greek, Latin, and Spanish. Those are our languages that we can offer that would count towards your requirement. And you have to take the first and the second semester course in the same language. So you cannot, for example, take Spanish one and French two. Okay, it has to be in the same language. Um, if you already took a language and you're proficient, then you should take placement test in foreign language and that can actually place you out of the requirement. Okay? If the placement test places you in our third course, third semester course, which we call 251, then you have thereby satisfied the requirement and you're done. If you choose that way. You can also say, oh wow, I am placed in 251 or even higher, well, I'm gonna go on with this language. And we want you to do that actually because that way you can get quite a, a very quick minor, for example, or a major even, in the language that you've already uh, studied in school. We actually make sweeten the pot for you for that. Let me take you a little, tell you a little secret. I'm from the foreign languages department, so I, I think I can give away a secret. If you take the placement test and you place into 251 in any language, any language of the ones that we offer. You can then take that 251, and if you pass it, we give you credit for 251, which would be three hours. But we also give you credit for the 112 that you never took. So with that one course, you can earn seven credits. All right? That's my little secret. Hopefully that will, well, why, why do we do that? Of course we do that because we are hoping that you will continue your studies in the language that you've already started. Okay, so just to re, uh, uh, to sum up, you must take the placement test today if you've studied two years of a language in school and you want to continue that language. You also have to start to take the placement test if you're planning to place out of your language. You do not need the placement test if you're planning to start with a new language. Which also, by the way, would be an interesting thing. Consider, right? Learn something new. Big Latin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Experiential learning requirement. This is something that we have, that every student has to um, satisfy. But I, I always say, don't worry about it. The EXP connects a, an experience outside of the classroom with reflection. And it can be done in many ways. So for example, if you take supervised um, undergraduate research, if you study with some professor and do your own research, well, that's out of the classroom, an experience outside of the classroom, but you're also hopefully reflecting about it. Right? You can also do it by, say, by some creative activity, if you produce art, or if you do service learning, or study abroad, or go on Mercer on mission, or do an internship. Do you see why I'm saying don't worry about it? As a Mercer student, you probably can't help but do one or two or three of these things over the course of your career here. So uh, there is no credit to these courses, but everybody has to have one, at least one at the end of your career. That's why it's on your checklist, okay? But I don't think it'll be an, a problem. All right, now you know everything about those things that are common to both tracks. In the following, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about those things that only pertain to one of the two tracks. And we're starting with INT. Here is a, a block that only INT students have to take. It's called Western Heritage. So we're interested here in 
any kind of course that addresses the creation and development of Western civilization in any form. Okay, so as you can see, the first one here is Africana Studies in History 225. It's often cross-listed, that's why it has the two designation. But there's also CLA, you know what CLA is? Classics, yeah, that's the courses that I teach actually. Uh, then you have English courses, foreign language, great books, history, philosophy, religion, and Southern studies. Any of these particular classes will do it. You just have to take one, but you do have to take one of them. Don't come to me in your last month at Mercer and tell me I forgot to take this. Then we have a real problem, okay? That's why we're giving you the checklist. So please check it off at some point in your career. Here's another field that you have to um, satisfy, religious heritage. Now notice, these are not all of the courses in the religion department. There are a couple, as you can see, at the bottom of the list, but there are also courses in Africana studies, English, and philosophy that are eligible to satisfy this requirement. Here are the list, the, the, the courses in the block called Human Behavior and Society. Um, a couple of decades ago, we would probably have said social studies or social science. Okay. So a lot of these courses come from communications or uh, economics, journalism, <coughs> political science, psychology, sociology. And what's the last one, WGS? Women's and Gender Studies. So any of these courses will count towards that particular block. Also, you have to take something in creative expression. And you actually can do that in two ways. The first way is that you study somebody else's way of creating, uh, of expressing himself or herself creatively. So it could be some piece of art. It could be a, a course on visual art. It could be a course on music that somebody composed. It could be a course on theater. Any of the courses in the list will do it. The alternative that you have for creative expression is not studying somebody else's, but creating your own. So we call it production. You're producing your own art. So if you take a course in drawing, for example, that will satisfy the requirement. Or in uh, poetry writing, you produce your own poetry, that's an artistic expression, right? Or if you take any of the music ensembles that we offer here at Mercer, and I've listed them at the bottom. Now with those, I have to say, you have to take, these are one hour courses. For the music courses, you would have to take three of them, because they have, they have to be three hours altogether. All right. Now you know everything about I and T, okay? You know the things that are common to both tracks, and you, I just told you the, the, the parts that are special to I and T. Let's talk about great books. Great books is your alternative. Um, it is a series of courses that looks at great works that shaped Western civilization. Notice I'm not saying great literature, because it's more than that. It's uh, literary works, but it's also all sorts of other kind of texts, like um, philosoph philosophical texts, could be scientific texts, it could be political, it could be psychological, right? So it's not just liter literature, but it's chronological. Um, from GBK 101 all the way through to GBK 407, you, you're going from ancient times to the 20th century. Look at the list here of the authors that we study, that we read. We start with Homer, which is our oldest text in the, in the Western civilization. And we go through the Greeks, Aeschylus and Sophocles and Thucydides. We then hit the Romans with Virgil, it becomes sort of medieval, right? Chaucer, Machiavelli. We're going to the early new 
period with Shakespeare, uh, the, the Europeans with uh, Descartes and Hobbes and Milton. Then we go into the Americans, Hamilton, Madison. Uh, and then we are slowly arriving in the 20th century with Mendel, Freud, Weber, Nietzsche, and so on. It's a fantastic course of studies. I wish I could have taken that as a student. But I have to say, it's a different kind of approach than what you're getting in the IMT program. Uh, you have to read a lot. This is a long list of authors. So if you like to read, and discuss and write about what you've read, then this is for you. Uh, statistically, about 15 to 20 percent of our students take the great books course. Uh, the INT is a much larger ses uh, sector. It's been at Mercer, the great books uh, program, since 1982. Um, it is interdisciplinary. I just showed you some of the names, uh, it's not just literary. Um, no lectures, we are reading primary texts. And I think this is a big difference to the INT approach. Uh, I used to be a great books director, so let me, let me tell you a little example that I always use. If you take, if you learn about psychology in the INT track, guess how you're gonna approach that? You're probably gonna have a textbook in this textbook, there will be information on all sorts of psychological approaches. One of them will be on Sigmund Freud. And you will read about Sigmund Freud in your textbook. This is the INT track approach. Guess how the Great Books does it? The Great Books will not give you a textbook. What will they give you instead? You're going to be asked to read one book by Sigmund Freud probably going to read the whole book, and then you're going to discuss it. So you see, you're getting the same material, but you're getting it in a different way. It's a different approach. The book is the teacher. That's our maxim in the Great Books program. And uh, it is a very exciting program, but you have to make that decision based on your own personal preferences. All right, let's talk about academic majors. We're leaving the foundational studies. Every student here will have to choose a major. Uh, you can, f the earliest time you can choose a major is after midterm of your spring semester, your first year spring semester. So you cannot choose it right now. You have to wait until next March or so. Here's the list of our majors. I really hope you'll find something among them that appeals to you. Uh, there are some very traditional majors in the first part of the, of the list. The second, the middle part, are those interdisciplinary majors that I talked to you about. The large ones, the ones that have a lot of credit hours. Uh, and then, if nothing of that appeals to you, you can always have an individualized major. You can actually create your own major. The way you do it is you put together a proposal in writing of the kinds of courses that you would like to take and make it into a major. And this can be courses from Mercer and also from outside of Mercer, up to a certain degree. And you, need, you will have to find three faculty members that are going to support your proposal. And then you get their signatures and you send that to me. And if this is a sound proposal, I will sign off on it. And you have yourself an individualized major. Academic majors have to uh, have 15 hours at least. I'm sorry, no, it's not right. At least 15 hours have to be on the upper division. They have to have 27 hours minimum. Um, you have to, you can only choose it, as I said, in your second semester, but you have to choose your academic major by the time you have 65 hours. Please don't wait beyond that time, okay? I will have to send you a nasty letter threatening you that I'll sign you up in Latin if you can choose, okay? So once you hit the 65 hours, please declare a major. 
12 hours of your major have to be taken at Mercer. Okay? So you can transfer in credit for your major, but it's not unlimited. After all, you're getting a Mercer degree, so we want you to take some of the hours, at least. <coughs> some, uh, 12 upper division hours have to be taken at Mercer. And again, like we said before, remember, you have to have the 2.0 GPA overall. Well, you also have to have a 2.0 GPA in your major. That's separate from the overall GPA. Here's the list of minors that we can offer you. The list is very similar to those for the main, to, to that for the majors. Again, you have the option of having an individualized minor. Quite a few students actually do that. Um, it's an exciting pursuit if, if you so choose. And this time you actually just need to have two faculty members that back your proposal. Academic minors have between 15 and 18 hours normally, and in, uh, this time six hours have to be upper division, and six hours have to be taken at Mercer. Six hours of upper division. And again, also for the minor, you need that 2.0 GPA. So, now we've talked about foundational studies, the major and the minor. Now we're talking about additional depth. Remember, that's your third requirement. Uh, additional depths you can satisfy in three ways. You can either choose a second major, and a lot of our students do that. Uh, I, I can speak from my experience as the director of the Latin major. I don't think I've ever had a Latin major who did not have some other major as well. Okay. Because the Latin major is fairly small, so it is quite easy to get another major. So a second major is a good way of doing, of satisfying additional depths. You can also have just a minor to satisfy additional depths. Or if you choose one of those large interdisciplinary majors, then that by itself already constitutes uh, the requirement and you don't have to take any, any other major or minor. Uh, again, you have to have a at least a C or a 2.0 in that additional depth uh, area. Here's something very exciting and very new, something that is only just developing. It's called certificates. So uh, lately, we have introduced a number of certificates that are really interdisciplinary in their approach, and they're also experiential in their approach. So a, a lot of our certificates actually include an internship some sort. Uh, they cannot take the place of a minor, but I think they are a very uh, interesting way of getting additional depth. Um, and there are five that are in the books right now. And the, the list is growing, actually. We're working on some more. But the five that we have are actuarial science, applied social justice, faith-based diplomacy, leadership and ethics, and political communication. All these would be a very nice complement to your major and minors. All right, congratulations, you've sat through two thirds of my talk now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some policies and procedures. Here's the, probably the most important thing that I can tell you today is this. You are responsible for knowing the general education requirements. will give you advisors and help, and professors will look after you, but in the final analysis, you are responsible for your own course of studies. That's why we give you those checklists. That's why we tell you about the catalog, right? So please be, be aware and, and, and follow up on the courses you take and check them off on your list. If you are granted any exceptions, which sometimes happens, you know, sometimes courses are not offered, and you need to ask for a substitution for a certain course, and come to me and I grant you that, well, the most important thing then to do is what? Is to keep that document. When I send you an email, please keep it so that when graduation time comes, you can actually say, here, the dean granted me this exception. 
So we keep all the paperwork. We've talked about the catalog. Right here you have the 2018-2019 edition. Yours will be the 2019-2020 edition. That will be the catalog that counts for you. Okay? If you don't do anything, that's gonna count for you. Now there is a way to change catalogs. It's actually quite easy. All you have to do is fill out a form. It's the change of catalog forms and send it to my office. And that's all you have to do. But you have to be aware that if you change catalog, that change will pertain to all areas of your studies. Okay? So for example, if you think the English department, which is your major, has recently changed the curriculum, and the new curriculum is much more advantageous for you than the old one. Well, then go ahead and change the catalog to that new year. But you have to be aware that the catalog of the new year will now also count for your foundational studies and for your minor and for everything else. Okay? So you can't cherry pick. Once you change the catalog, it's fair to pick. So it's, it's, a, it's an important decision and you, you have to be careful about it. Here's what some of our new students tell us. All of them really tell us uh, MRSA is harder than high school. You have to be ready for that. Uh, there is no question about it. You, you all probably were the stars in your high school. Okay? But in, at MRSA, you're together with other stars. And you are going to have, there will be new dynamics. And you will probably earn your first B or C. At MRSA. It's going to happen. Okay? Now, if you fall behind in, in some of your courses or in one of your courses, Seek the conversation. That's a very important piece of advice I can give you. Please go to that instructor immediately and talk with them and find ways of catching up or doing better. Okay? Conversation is the most important thing you can do. Um, and and your, your instructors at Mercer want that conversation. That's why they're here. You know, our, our faculty chose to be at Mercer. They could have gone to some other larger universities, but they chose to be here because they're looking for that intimate relationship with the, with the students. And so you should look for that too. Email your advisor every now and then. Talk with them. Don't just go to the advising session when it's time to register for new courses. Keep the contact. Here's another thing that's going to be important. Overall, of course, your, your catalog guides your course of studies, but in the individual case of the course, it's the syllabus that guides your course of studies. And you will uh, receive a syllabus for, a, for each course you take on the very first day. Okay? Our, our instructors have to do that. They have to give you a syllabus. And they have to explain in that syllabus the, the policies for their course. Now at Mercer we give, we grant a lot of freedom to our instructors. Uh, we let them teach the courses in their way. But what we do ask of them is that they lay out the rules and regulations in the syllabus. And so for you that means you have to carefully read that syllabus. Because each course will differ. For example, grading policies will differ. Even the grading scale will differ. My grading scale in Latin, my Latin course, will probably be different from my Spanish column or from my mathematic, mathematics column. Okay, so uh, it is important to look at that carefully. Attendance policies differ. We do not prescribe to our instructors how they have to handle attendance. They lay it out, each for themselves, in the syllabus. And also how they give you grades, for example, for participating in class. Uh, some instructors may not give you any grade for that, but others will, and if they do, they have to explain in the syllabus how they do that. So please look very carefully at the syllabi. Uh, honor code is important in that when you come to Mercer on your first day, there will be a, a gathering, an assembly here, and you will actually pledge to 
follow the Mercer University Honor Program. And it is a, a very important system, which is actually run by students. It's not run by the dean's office. It's run by students, university-wide. And if there's any, uh, any suspicion that a student violated the honor code by cheating in a test or maybe plagiarizing a paper, there is actually an obligation on both the professors and fellow students to bring that to the, atten to the uh, attention of the Honor Council. And the Honor Council consists of fellow students of yours who will then examine that course, investigate, and there will be a hearing, and there will be, there can be sanctions. The sanctions can range from zero for the particular assignment, to maybe a zero for the course, and if it's a really strong case, it could go as far as suspension, especially if it's a repeated violation. So this is a very important system run by students, and you have to get familiar with that. It's described in the LAIR. I don't know if you are aware of the LAIR. The LAIR is our student handbook. I'm, uh, I'm sure you will, will get that at some point. Yeah, and also, uh, you should consider becoming part of the Honor Council yourselves. Uh, you can become justices on the Honor Council and serve on that, on that uh, group. If things go wrong in your courses, especially in your relationship with faculty, you have the right to lodge a grievance or an appeal. Um, and again, this process of lodging an appeal is described in the layer. The, the, the most important thing that you need to know from now, I think, is that it starts at the bottom. Okay, so your first complaint should be directly to the instructor. If you don't get a satisfactory resolution from the instructor, you bring this to the department chair of that instructor. And if it's still not resolved, you bring it to me. And then I will handle it but you have the right to bring grievances. Uh, here's another important thing though. You have to do that within 30 days of the end of the course that, you, that the grievance is related to. Okay? So 30 days after that, it's no longer possible to appeal. Uh, the other day, I, and you wouldn't believe that, but I got an email from a student who graduated five years ago, wanted to uh, appeal a grade in the course. At that point, it's, it's way too late to do that. <laughs> Transfer credit. You can all bring in credit uh, before you even start studying here, and you probably are doing that with AP credit, right, or IB credit, or dual enrollment, and our registrar probably doesn't even have your results at this point. They're gonna come in over the month of July, and so, so in some cases, we'll actually have to change your schedules a little bit. Uh, but that is one way of bringing in credit. Another way is to get transfer credit while you're a student here. And you can actually do that. Remember, there are some limitations that we talked about. In the major, you, you have to have 12 hours from Mercer, right? So you can't endlessly uh, bring in credit. But you can do that by simply filling out a transient permission form and send it to my office. And I will then check up on that and, and we'll give you the go ahead. Here's one important thing about transfer credit. Transfer credit does not affect your GPA. Okay, so the Mercer GPA is only calculated on the basis of courses that you take at Mercer. This can be important when you try to repair your GPA. You have to take courses here to do that rather than elsewhere. What's the difference between drops and withdrawals? This will be important in your first uh, few weeks. Okay, a drop is when you, you're registered for a course, you come, you take the first or second reading, and you decide it's not for you. Maybe you've seen the syllabus of this course and you just decide this is not gonna work for me. Well, you can drop the course in the first week get out of the course, no questions asked, but you have to do it 
you have to fill out the drop ad form by the Friday of the first week. If you miss that time, you can't drop the course anymore. You can still withdraw from the course, and that actually works until the 11th week. So you have quite a long window of getting out of courses, but now it's gonna be through a withdrawal, and that means there will be a W in your transcript for that course. Now you may ask, is that bad? Well, I usually tell my students, if it's a, a limited number of W's, it's okay. I would say about four W's over your career. I, if I were your employer or your graduate student, uh, graduate program uh, at a committee for admission, I would probably not raise question. But if you come to me with 20 W's, <laughs> I'm going to start thinking, well, that person is not really serious about what they start. They, they start a lot of stuff and they don't pull, uh, pull through. So you have to be judicious about that. But sometimes, of course, it can be uh, advantageous to take a W. Because a W can be better than a, a D or an F in a course. So up to the 11th week, Make up your mind. Okay, but, uh, we will all remind you of that withdrawal date uh, that usually is uh, in your 11th week. Um, there are, can be some implications of W's on financial aid, but I don't know enough about that. That's something you need to ask your financial aid advisor about. And also, of course, our standard workload is 15 hours. So you should strive to have about 15 hours. I didn't say that earlier, right? 15 hours is, is what we try to give you in the first semester and encourage you to, to have in the, in the remaining semesters as well. You can go up to 18 hours. You can even go beyond 18 hours, but you have to get permission from me. I will look at your grades. If you're a strong, a strong student, I will actually allow you to go to 18. But there's another caveat to that. You will have to pay additional tuition if you go over 18. Repeating courses is possible at Mercer. Um, you can take a, a course twice, but not three times. So you can repeat any course one time. Uh, the only thing to remember is that the second attempt counts. So that whatever you score in the second course, Second time, that will be your grade. So if you had a C the first time around, you didn't like it, well, you can repeat the course, but if you score a D, then the D will stand. Okay, so again, this is, this is gonna be an important decision to make. Also, there cannot be more than four courses repeated altogether. Let me briefly wrap this up by talking about offic officially excused absences. I told you that our instructors have uh, a lot of uh, leeway about how they conduct their course, and that includes the attendance policy. So they will tell you whether they expect you to be in class a certain number of times or not, and it's up to them. However, there are certain rules that entitle students to excused absences. Okay? That's, that's handled by my office. So for example, if you have religious observances, we will allow you to take that day off. Okay. Or if you have, if you participate in university-sponsored activities, say you're on the basketball team and you travel to a game, or you are on a music ensemble and you have concerts somewhere, or you are on an academic team, like debate team, and you have a, a, a meeting somewhere, we want you to do that and we allow you an ex officially excused absence for that. Just let my office know. Um, automatically eligible to be excused are things like illnesses, if they're documented uh, by, a, by a doctor, professional, medical professional. Funerals, if they're in the immediate family, and we take that quite narrowly, parents, siblings, grandparents. Uh, if it's beyond that, you have to go to the instructor and get the instructor legal and military obligations 
and also presenting papers at conferences. We want you to do that. So we, we strongly consider allowing you an exclusive options program. Potentially eligible. So this is now the step down a little bit. Certain family emergencies that may arise. Uh, some of our students are parents, and if they have a sick child, we will certainly accommodate that, try to accommodate it. Uh, family obligations like weddings and graduations. If you're reasonable about that and don't make it into a three-week vacation, I will, I will consider it. Um, interviews with graduate and professional schools, of course, we want you to continue with your pursuits, and so we, we certainly support that. Exams for professional advancement and university-sponsored field trips. All these things are eligible for Dean's office exclusive. Here's what's not eligible. Any of these things you have to negotiate with your instructor directly. Conferences that you want to go to but you don't present anything. Outside of class activities like having to watch films or going to lectures for other courses, you need to negotiate that with your instructor or you have to work around it. Um, Activities for student organizations, multiple exams in one day, I can't help you with that. That's, uh, you have to plan for that uh, accordingly. Sniffles, sore throats, and headaches. Don't call me. And especially don't call me about boyfriend and girlfriend issues. <laughs> Couple of uh, privacy issues. You have the right to inspect your educational records that are kept at the university and to um, uh, ask for amendments. You also have the right to allow your guardians, parents most often, to uh, look into your records in a way that, for example, they can talk with your professors about your, your progress at Mercer, or talk with me. Okay? But in order to do that, the student has to give permission. This is an online form that you have to fill out call it the FERPA form. If you don't fill that out, uh, I will not be able to talk with you um, on the phone, with your parents on the phone. So the students have to give that permission. So I encourage parents to talk with their students about that. Last thing, support services. If, if things go, uh, if things are difficult, there are support services here at Mercer. I'm, I'm just gonna highlight two of them. First one is the Office of Access and Accommodation. If you have any kind of disability, such as a learning disability or a physical disability or anything that you would like to get accommodation for, we will certainly uh, examine your case and hopefully also grant you that. But the way to do that is you have to fill out a, an online form on the, on the website of the Access and Accommodation Office. Um, give you an example quickly. Uh, in my classes, my Latin classes, I have tests, and some students uh, need, for example, a quiet room to take a test. And they can document that need, and they bring us the paperwork, and then our access office will issue that uh, possibility, and they can then take the test in a quiet room. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, thing we grant. Uh, finally, support services in terms of any, you know, any distress that you experience. This will be a stressful first semester. There's no way around it. There will be a lot of work. There will be situations where you think, I need help. We can offer you that help. We have uh, what we call CAPS, the Counseling and Psychological Services. Um, they are located on campus. You can go to them and talk with a counselor. And the nice thing about it is that it's totally confidential. Okay, so the CAPS counselors cannot, for example, tell me or your professors that you came to see them and what you talked about. Your, your conversations there will be confidential. So I encourage you, if you, if you encounter any of these difficult situations, take advantage of those kinds of services that we offer. All right, it's then 20, I've gone over a little bit. I
apologize for that. Uh, so our question and answer session probably, let's just do that in private. Okay, if you have any questions for me, I will be standing over there and I encourage you to come over and just let me know. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. You have been a great audience. Thank you and uh, I think we're getting instructions now. <laughs>